Hello and welcome back to FT.com. We are about to embark on a two-week series looking at the rise of the index, the change and increase in the role of indexes in setting market prices around the world. And I'm here to try to explain why. Now, the role of index providers has changed absolutely profoundly over the last few years. I can still remember working at the FT next to people who had helped calculate the FTSE index using a slide rule each day after the market closed. Now, thanks to computerization, indexes have proliferated. In the case of MSCI, one of the biggest index companies, they produce 200,000 indexes. FTSE Russell calculates some 500,000 indexes every day. S&P Dow Jones, the biggest of them all, calculates some million indexes every day. Even, if, even 10 years ago, they would only have been calculating a matter of a few hundred. Obviously, a profound change. What's also changed is the degree of their power over markets, and that's largely because of this phenomenon that we're illustrating for you here, the rise of passive investing. As uh, money has switched to passive funds that merely track indexes, Plainly, the power of the index, the importance of the index increases. If they change the composition of the index, any money in those index funds has similarly to move into whatever new stocks or bonds are being added to that index. But it goes further than that. Benchmarking is vitally important. If you're an active manager, you know that the pension funds and their consultants who you are hoping to, who you're hoping, whose business you're hoping to attract will be deciding on the basis of comparing your performance to the benchmark. That means that you can't ignore it. 20 odd years ago, people would talk about whether they owned a stock or not. Now, in my experience, fund managers will say they're overweight or underweight. Everything is determined or is viewed through the lens of, a, uh, of an index. Now, if we take a look at the kind of money that's involved here, this is uh, a ranking from Morningstar of uh, the assets in uh, US open-ended funds that are linked to the various index providers. And you can see that there is also quite a concentration of power. The uh, big three index providers, FTSE, Russell, S&P, Dow Jones, and MSCI, between them have some three quarters of that market. Moreover, Barclays is extremely dominant within bond indexes. Now, Fortunately, there is not too much in the way of conflict of interest. The main equity index providers are all independently held and can say quite accurately that they don't have an interest in whether their indexes go up or down um, and that their rules are open and transparent. However, there are complaints that there are potential conflicts of interest when it comes to uh, indexes controlled by banks when you add a bond to an index, you're reflective, effectively requiring those who are benchmarked to that index to buy that bond. If you're a bank, you could then issue some of that bond. That's, there's obviously the potential there, at any rate, for a conflict of interest. In the wake of the LIBOR scandal, regulators and the public are much more alive to those risks, and banks very keen to avoid any perception that some conflict could be going on appear to be trying to uh, find buyers for their businesses. It's a very interesting development. Now, obviously there are many things that are very positive about the growth of indexing. They've uh, allowed a uh, much greater understanding of what really drives returns in markets. But given how important they are, it is worrying how often they are little understood. If you talk to investment advisors, if you talk to uh, the investment companies themselves, you'll find that there's almost never any questioning from uh, clients or advises us to uh, exactly what is in the different indexes. That's important because there are important differences between indexes. This is one example. You see the Russell 2000 and the S&P 600, both of which are measures of uh, US small cap stocks. The Russell 2000 is the most popular benchmark, particularly for active managers. It takes the first 1000 stocks by size and puts them into a large cap index called the Russell 1000. The Russell 2000 is the next 2000 down. Very clear criteria based solely on market value. On the days when the membership changes, people can, are able to predict in advance what will happen, and that is regularly 
the day of heaviest trading each year in New York. Now the S&P 600 is different. They uh, apply a requirement that uh, companies have already shown uh, some consistent profitability before they will be admitted. They also have minimum requirements for liquidity that are much more stringent than the Russell. The result is that that's arguably a less interesting index to analyze if you're an academic interested in how small caps behave, but that it's much more likely to actually perform well. Uh, if you are an ETF, if you're a passive manager, you probably want to tie yourself to that, while active managers want to tie themselves to the Russell index because it's easier to beat. Another example where differences in indexes can change perceptions. These are the three main indexes of the commodities sector, currently known as the S&P GSCI, the Bloomberg, and the CRB. You can see that if you believe the uh, GSCI, we are now actually lower than we were 15 years ago. If you believe the CRB, we are still showing very comfortable profits. The direction may be, same, may be the same, but the overall picture looks radically different. That is because arguably the GSCI is overweighted in oil and the CRB is underweighted in oil. But the critical point is that without understanding those differences, these indexes can warp perceptions. So that is why we are spending the next two weeks looking at indexes. They are far more powerful than they used to be. Rather than just tracking markets these days, they have a strong tendency to lead them. And yet there, is, there are widespread misunderstandings about exactly what those indexes do, what the differences between them are. We will be trying to shed a little light on that.